I'm Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for September 9th, 2023. This week, six Colorado residents filed a lawsuit in the Denver City and County District Court to disqualify former President Donald Trump from running for re-election in 2024 under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The petitioners are seeking to prevent Trump from appearing as a candidate on the state's 2024 Republican presidential primary ballot and quote, any future election ballot. For today's archive episode, I picked an episode from January 19th, 2021, in which Alan Rosenstein sat down with Daniel Hemmel and Gerard Maglioka in the wake of the January 6th attack on the Capitol to discuss Section 3 and its potential as a method for preventing former President Trump from running in 2024. I'm Alan Rosenstein, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, January 19th, 2021. In the wake of the January 6th mob attack on the Capitol, some have called for the invocation of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Section 3 disqualifies anyone who has engaged in rebellion or insurrection against the United States from public office. In particular, critics of President Trump have seized on this as a potential way of preventing him from running in 2024. I spoke about Section 3 with Professors Daniel Hemmel of the University of Chicago Law School and Gerard Magliocca of the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. It's the Lawfare Podcast, January 19th. Dan Hemmel and Gerard Magliocca on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Gerard, let me start with you. What does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment say and what is its historical context? Section three of the 14th Amendment says that a group of either former or current military officers and government officials are ineligible to serve in future office if they have sworn an oath to defend the Constitution and then have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution or given aid and comfort to the enemies of the Constitution. The reason for this being uh, ratified as part of the 14th Amendment was to prevent former Confederates, especially people in high Confederate office, from serving again in Congress or in other offices, either at the federal or state level, unless Congress, by the terms of Section 3, gives those people an amnesty, which a two-thirds vote in each House of Congress can do. So the original purpose was quite clear. Everybody understood that it was about preventing people who had joined the Confederacy and had had some significant position prior to the Civil War from serving in office again. And that's how it was applied in the years immediately after the 14th Amendment was ratified. And and so was it ultimately successful in its stated purpose, which was to keep high Confederate officers from reentering political life? No. But that's because Congress decided to grant a broad amnesty to the people who were covered. Uh, That was done in 1872, largely because of a feeling in the country that there was a need to get beyond the Civil War, that the turmoil of Reconstruction was something that should be put in the past. And so while it did keep these people out of office prior to 1872, Afterwards, many of them did come back into Congress or into significant positions in state government. And this, of course, can be tied to the broader story of the failure of Reconstruction and the kind of rise of what became Jim Crow and kind of what was described in the South as a redeemer movement by Southern Democrats. So, no, I think you'd have to say that Section 3 was largely a failure, though whether that's because of the way it was written or the way it was applied subsequently by Congress, that's a harder question to answer. So b- before I turn to the, the, the present day issue, let me, let me ask one more historical question, which is Section 3 does not just apply to the Civil War, right? On its own terms, it applies to anyone who is engaged in an insurrection or rebellion against the United States. So obviously the Civil War counts as an insurrection or rebellion, but do we know at least what those who wrote and ratified Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, do we know what they had in mind uh, of what counted as insurrection or rebellion beyond just the Civil War? Not really. There was 
no discussion of that at the time, and there were no prior examples that they really could look to. There's no case, for example, that they could look to. So in that sense, this is really a sui generis situation in that everyone understood that the Confederacy was an insurrection or rebellion, but no one gave any thought to what else might come along later. Now, of course, it's interesting to see how people have widely described what occurred at the Capitol a week and a half ago as an insurrection. And that kind of lends some credence to the thought that there's something about it that relates to the term insurrection, which we can talk about later. But uh, no, they didn't have anything else in mind when Section 3 was written and ratified. So let's let's turn to the, the present day. And let me turn to you, Dan. So you recently wrote a piece in the Washington Post urging caution about using the 14th Amendment to bar President Trump from running again, in particular in 2024. So let, let me first ask, why are we even talking about Section 3? So impeachment already provides a mechanism to bar a president from holding future office. If the president is convicted, then Congress can, as part of the punishment, bar him from holding future office. That seems like the most straightforward way of keeping Trump out of the White House going forward. So what advantages, if any, does the Section 3 route provide? One is that impeachment and removal at the Senate stage requires a two-thirds vote. And while it's plausible that 17 Republicans will join 50 Democrats to convict Trump on the incitement of insurrection charge and then disqualify him from future office, that uh, will be quite an uphill battle. Whereas there may be, and some have argued that there are mechanisms that would allow for the disqualification of Trump under 14th Amendment Section 3 without a two-thirds vote in the Senate. Second, the scope of Section 3 is somewhat broader than disqualification under the impeachment procedure in the Constitution. I don't think this is particularly relevant to Trump, but it may be relevant to other participants in the January 6th insurrection. Uh, So the offices from which you would be banned include uh, state positions. And this is relevant to, say, state lawmakers from Arizona and Virginia who participated in the Stop the Steal rally. And third, uh, it's not just Trump. There are the Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs and Paul Gosar. There's Mo Brooks from Alabama. Um, Some have even talked about whether the 14th Amendment Section 3 might apply to Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley. So there are a whole range of actors to whom Section 3 might be applied, but who are unlikely to be impeached and removed or are members of Congress, so they wouldn't be subject to impeachment and removal. And so presumably, though, then the application of Section 3 to, I don't want to call them peripheral figures, but but let's say people who weren't necessarily at the rally themselves. So I'm thinking of Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley in the Senate. I'm thinking of the more than 120 House Republicans who voted to uh, reject the Pennsylvania and Arizona slate of electors. Presumably, that would raise difficult questions, kind of getting back to what Gerard said earlier, about what counts as an insurrection or, or rebellion. I mean, how, how would we go about figuring, figuring that out? Yeah, that, there are a lot of difficult questions about the application of Section 3, even to Trump, and perhaps even to Biggs, Brooks, and Gosar, if it turns out that they, in fact, orchestrated the events of January 6th with the leaders of the Stop the Steal rally. So there's the question of what is an insurrection or rebellion. We know that the framers of the 14th Amendment were thinking about the Confederacy, Uh, But they also pointedly did not limit the language to the Confederacy. We have some other legal sources that could allow us to give meaning to those words, but they don't all point in the same direction. There's a lot of insurance law about, or some insurance law about what is an insurrection or rebellion, because there are some insurance policies that include exclusions for insurrection or rebellion. So we could look to that. Um, We could look to the Insurrection Act. And then even if you decide that the events of January 6th were an insurrection or rebellion, and I think most agree that it would be on the insurrection side rather than on the rebellion side, there's a question of what does it mean to engage in an insurrection or rebellion, and what does it mean to give aid or comfort to America's enemies? On those questions, I think we have a little bit of historical precedent, but whoever the ultimate decision maker is, uh, and some of the conversation today will be about who should be the ultimate decision maker, will have to flesh out those terms. You actually just mentioned this distinction between insurrection and and rebellion. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that and and what you think the operative distinctions are, and and also why you think there's necessarily a 
a distinction here. I mean, it, in the law generally, and also in the constitution, there, there are plenty of these examples of, you know, double terms, you know, I'm thinking of high crimes and misdemeanors, I'm thinking of cruel and unusual punishment, where it's not always obvious whether they refer to two separate things, or whether it's just a single phrase that refers to a uh, sort of general category of conduct, um, given that lawyers love verboseness, and they love synonyms. So I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about this distinction between insurrection and, and rebellion. Judge Magruder from the First Circuit has an opinion in Home Insurance Company versus Davila, which is a 1954 case about insurrection or rebellion in an insurance policy. And he says it starts out as an insurrection. Once you have de facto control over an area of the country, it becomes a rebellion. And then if you actually succeed, then it becomes a revolution. So rebellion is an insurrection that has progressed to a certain stage. I'm not sure if that's what the framers of the 14th Amendment had in mind, though the Confederacy started out as an insurrection and reached the point of rebellion. If I might add, I did take a look just in the most basic sense of sort of what did what was the dictionary definition term of these words at the time that the 14th Amendment was ratified. And if you look, basically, the distinction seems to be that an insurrection is a brief rebellion and a rebellion is a more extended insurrection, uh, which sort of dovetails a little bit with the description that, that Dan just gave about the, uh, the opinion. Now, uh, that might lend some support to the thought that this could qualify as an insurrection because it was of short, relatively short duration, fortunately. Uh, another thing I'll point out is that uh, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which talks about voting, only uses the word rebellion. It does not use the word insurrection, which could be understood as suggesting some difference in degree between rebellion and insurrection, which would say that a rebellion is a more serious event. And maybe one thought there is that you lose your voting rights in a way that you don't if you uh, are only engaged in an insurrection. So I think that those offer some some clues. So let's let's now turn to the question of of who decides, as it were, whether someone is eligible or ineligible under Section 3. Now, one thing I think is notable is that Section 3 does not itself set out a mechanism to make someone ineligible. It sets out a mechanism to remove the ineligibility. But Section 3 simply states, if you have engaged in these actions, if you have engaged in rebellion or insurrection, you are not eligible, right? Just in the same way that the Constitution states, if you are not, you know, if you have not achieved, you know, 35 years uh, of age, you are not eligible to be the, the president. So so l- let me turn to you, Gerard. Who, who decides ultimately whether or not for a given individual, Section 3 has rendered them ineligible? The courts have to decide that. It is clearly a justiciable matter. There are cases from the late 1860s and early 1870s that address this question. So it's a judicial question. Congress, for example, cannot simply make someone ineligible because they declare it. Now, then the question is, okay, who who brings a challenge to somebody, either an office holder or a candidate, to the court saying that they are ineligible? Now, there, there's a problem because there is currently no federal enforcement authority in the United States Code to bring any sort of enforcement action. There was once, but there isn't anymore. State election authorities might have the authority to do this, but I can't say that I'm familiar with the election law of all 50 states, so I I don't know to what extent state election officials can enforce this or not. Uh, So those are at least two sources. Now, the the last thing to say is that uh, state legislatures, for example, would have the authority to expel a member, let's say, that they deemed ineligible under Section 3 under their own expulsion powers just as Congress can expel one of its own with a two-thirds vote if they think them ineligible to serve. So there are there are different actors who could step in, but if it's a non-legislator, then you pretty much need somebody to bring an enforcement action and a court to decide the question of ineligibility. L- let me push back just for a second, or let me just get kind of more clarification from you on why you think it's it's obviously a matter ultimately for the courts to decide. And the reason I ask is that, you know, looking at the text of Section 3, the only branch of government it mentions um, in terms of anything like enforcement is Congress, in, in the sense that it provides that it is Congress and only Congress that can reinstate eligibility. And then in addition, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment provides this general 
power to Congress to enforce the 14th Amendment through legislation. So, so given that, why do you think it's, it's so clear that uh, this actually has to be a, a court-driven process? Is it, is it just the, the precedent that was set? And maybe you can describe a little bit more what that precedent was. Or is, is there some other reason in addition that you think this is a, a court-centric process? Right. So first, Chief Justice Chase wrote an opinion as a circuit judge in which he said that Section 3 was not self-enforcing. And therefore, Congress was the body that had to act to enforce it and set up an enforcement mechanism. Now, one could question the reasoning that he used in that decision, but that's the only judicial precedent that we have. Let me just pause you just for a second, just, just on, on that, if I may. So when you say that, um, or when, when he said that, that Section 3 is not self-enforcing, is the idea that in the absence of some federal legislation, if a former Confederate politician were to run for federal office, there'd be no mechanism for someone to challenge that, or there'd be no mechanism for a state secretary of state to not put that person on the ballot. Is, is that what non-self-executing non-self-enfor- means or self-enforcing means? Yes, outside of a legislature, right? So Congress could enforce and did, in fact, enforce Section 3 simply by excluding people that they deemed ineligible to serve. So there was no need for an enforcement statute to make that happen. Uh, For state authorities, it's a little more complicated, but in general, it seems like state courts that decided these cases, at least one of them did refer to Chase's opinion just in, in sort of its analysis of how Section 3 was to be applied. Now, the other thing is when Congress did pass a law to enforce Section 3, they provided that an action had to be brought by, in effect, the new Department of Justice in 1870 to a federal court, and that the court would then adjudicate the case as to whether someone was ineligible or not. So that is kind of a very contemporary understanding of what Section 3 was about, and I think would be given significant deference by a court trying to understand whether Section 3 is self-enforcing or what role courts would have in deciding these matters. Dan, let me, let me turn to you for your thoughts. I think on the self-enforcing point, there are two possible interpretations of uh, Chief Justice Chase's opinion. One is, as Gerard says, that Congress needs to do something in order to enforce Section 3, that absent some act of Congress, their only potential authority would be to uh, exclude or expel one of their own members. I think there's another interpretation of Chase's opinion, which is that if someone is in violation of Section 3, Section 3 doesn't immediately kick into effect, rendering their future actions ultra virus or null and void. So in Griffin's case, where Chief Justice Chase, when he's writing circuit, issues his opinion, uh, it's a habeas petition brought by an African-American defendant who'd been sentenced by a judge who'd been involved in the Confederacy. And the defendant said that sentence is invalid because the judge couldn't hold that office by virtue of Section 3. And Chase rejects that argument. I don't think that necessarily precludes a Secretary of State from saying, I'm not going to put Josh Hawley on the ballot in 2024 because Josh Hawley violated Section 3. Caveat, I'm far from sure that Josh Hawley really did violate Section 3. Just as the Secretary of State could potentially say, uh, I'm not going to put so-and-so on the ballot because he's not 35 yet. One other point about mechanisms for potentially applying Section 3. To expel a member of Congress under the Constitution, you need a two-thirds vote. To exclude a member of Congress, then it really is a simple majority of that House. So I think we'll potentially see, uh, almost actually, we probably will see an attempt to enforce Section 3 when Mo Brooks gets reelected in 2022, uh, or Paul Gosar or Andy Biggs gets reelected in 2022. We'll see members of the House uh, say, If we get 218 people to vote to exclude, then we can exclude. Let me stay for a second on on the the, the Chase opinion, because there's something in it that I I don't fully understand. And and, and that's why it is that Chase held that Section 3 is non-self-enforcing. So I'm thinking, for example, of something totally different, right, which is the requirement for executive branch appointments under the Constitution. The president has to appoint, the Senate has to confirm. Now, if I understand the, the law correctly on this, you know, if that is violated, then any actions taken by the official who was not properly appointed, those actions 
they're illegal, right? They cannot be enforced. So why is it, uh, and does this Chase kind of explain this in the opinion, why is it that that Chase held that this provision, which um, section three that is, which on its face does seem self-enforcing, that it is not in fact self-enforcing? I understood Chase's, part of Chase's rationale to be an administrability issue. Uh, we've got to run a railroad here. And there are going to be lots of potential challenges to Southern officials before the 1872 amnesty, saying that they were perhaps involved in the insurrection or rebellion. And we'll just have a lot of uncertainty about which prisoners can really be there and which acts of government are legitimate. So if we were to apply the self-enforcing theory to Trump, well, at what stage does he begin to engage in insurrection or rebellion? Does it happen before he signs the big coronavirus, you know, $900 billion package so that that's actually not a valid law uh, and we all have to give our $600 back? Um, I think Chase foresees that if ineligibility backdates to when you enter insurrection or rebellion and then everything you do after that point is null and void, we're going to have a real mess on our hands. Right. And, and I might add that Chase was clearly uncomfortable with some aspects of Section 3. He pointed out in his opinion that it conflicted with other constitutional principles like the Bill of Attainder Clause or Ex Post Facto Clause. And so his interpretation requiring Congress to do something was a way to sort of soften that by taking the view that, look, right now, at least as applied to Virginia, which was the state where Chase was hearing the case, Congress had not passed any law enforcing Section 3. And so it, it would sort of put the ball in Congress's court to say, look, if you really want to do this, you have to take action, which Congress did pretty soon after Chase's opinion was issued. Uh, so then that would sort of just clear up or, or deal with some of the difficulties that arose from the application of Section 3. Dan, in, in your um, Washington Post piece, you expressed skepticism that Congress can simply vote to hold Trump ineligible under Section 3. And I was hoping you could expand on that. And presumably, if Congress voted and, and passed legislation, which would then be signed by presumably President Biden, uh, that would satisfy the requirement of congressional action for the enforcement of Section 3. So what is the concern nevertheless there? Right. So it's clear that Section 3 didn't change the bicameralism and presentment requirement, i.e. Congress can't just pass a law by a simple majority in both houses. We would need Biden to be involved. And then there's the question, did uh, Section 3 amend the Bill of Attainder Clause? Normally, we would think, well, a law passed by both houses of Congress and signed by the president that says Daniel Hemmel is excluded from future office, that looks a lot like a Bill of Attainder. So the argument for why that wouldn't be a bill of attainder would be uh, the position that Senator Lyman Trumbull took during the debate over the 14th Amendment. And he said, this just doesn't count as punishment. Excluding someone from office doesn't count as punishment. Um, but the modern day interpretation of the bill of attainder clause after Ex parte Garland would, I think, suggest that excluding someone from office is a bill of attainder. Um, if it's a narrowly cast, you know, Daniel Hemmel is excluded from office or Donald Trump is excluded from office. Chase recognizes this potential conflict and he says, to the extent that we can, we're going to read section three to be coherent with the rest of the constitution. We're not going to uh, infer that members of Congress changed the original constitution uh, or the Bill of Rights. So if there is a way of reading Section 3 uh, that doesn't disturb those prior provisions, we will. Uh, and then Trump would have a bill of attainder rejoinder. I should also say, just as a matter of healing, I'm not sure we want one of President Biden's first acts in, in office to be signing legislation that bars Donald Trump from running for president again. Let me just, just to make sure that our, our listeners who may not be familiar with the term bill of attainder. So a bill of attainder is a legislative act that punishes an individual or a group of individuals, usually without trial, right? That, that's what we're talking about here. So it's specifically saying Dan Hamill, Alan Rosenstein, Donald Trump, whoever is guilty of this crime, uh, whether or not, you know, whatever the consequences of that might be. Is that correct? Yes. And it goes beyond just crime. The Bill of Attainder precedents aren't limited to imposing criminal sanctions. Right. And if I'm, I might add now, one thing to think about is that 
Congress would not be passing a law declaring someone ineligible. They would be declaring their opinion that the person is ineligible. And the courts are free to disregard that opinion. Now, in a normal criminal case, right, let's say that Congress passed a, a resolution saying uh, Gerard Magliacca is a murderer and should go to jail. Well, we would say that that causes all sorts of problems, largely because of creating bias among uh, jurors or anyone involved in the case. It's kind of political pressure that would raise due process questions. Now, it's a little bit different when you're talking about something where it's not a it's not a case involving a kind of penalty like that and also it's something which is in response to you know an extraordinary event rather than an ordinary run of the mill criminal prosecution so i i think that those are some of the reasons to distinguish this from a bill of attainder in addition to the fact that there was all this discussion in the 39th congress about how section 3 was a kind of you know, modification of or was not inconsistent with the Bill of Attainder Clause. But I mean, it's a debatable proposition. And I think that this here, uh, there are two potential thises that we could be talking about. One is Congress passes a law that's signed by President Biden that says Donald Trump can't run for office again. And I think that's the the case where the Bill of Attainder rejoinder is going to be the strongest. Uh, Another is Congress passes a concurrent resolution expressing the sense of the Senate and the House uh, that what Donald Trump did was engaging in an insurrection or rebellion. I don't think that's a bill of attainder. It also doesn't, by its own terms, preclude Trump from uh, running for office again in 2024. My understanding was that Gerard was quite sensibly arguing for the second approach, the concurrent resolution approach, which I also think uh, is potentially a good avenue for the House and Senate to go down. Right. That's correct. Now, the only thing is there needs to be some enforcement process or some process outlined somewhere. And that can't be done just in a resolution. It has to be done in an act, although that could be done separately in a more general Section 3 enforcement statute that would also address all of the people who were involved in the actual attack in the Capitol directly, that is the people in the mob. So that might be one way to handle that. Concurrent resolution for one aspect and a statute for the enforcement process aspect. So let's let's turn to the enforcement statute part of it. So Gerard, earlier in the conversation, you, you mentioned that shortly after Justice Chase uh, held that Section 3 was not self-enforcing, Congress then implemented or, or, or passed an act that in fact enforced Section 3. So I was hoping you could give an overview of, of what that act was and how it worked and, and whether it could be potentially a model for something today. Yes. Yeah, so in 1870, Congress passed the first Ku Klux Klan Act, which dealt with many subjects arising out of the violent resistance to Reconstruction in the South, and two provisions in that act dealt with Section 3. The first basically said that the Department of Justice could bring an action against any ineligible official to oust that official, and that that kind of action had to be given priority in the federal court where it was filed. So that was just a civil action to oust the person who was ineligible, which the person could contest. Now, then there was also a criminal penalty put in for people who sort of knowingly or willfully continued to hold office even when they were ineligible, though there was only, as far as I can tell, one criminal case actually brought in any significant way under that act. And we don't really know what happened to the person who was prosecuted. So there were, though, many actions filed against people who were ineligible. For example, a couple of justices of the Tennessee Supreme Court, one of whom resigned, the other two fought it in the courts and managed to drag it out long enough that they got their amnesty and then were able to continue to serve or served in other capacities afterwards. Um, In terms of adapting a statute like that to modern times, one thought would be the 1870 Act only applied to office holders, not to candidates. And so it would seem as if a modern version ought to apply to candidates because it seems silly to wait until the person is actually sworn in. And then on the first day they're sworn in and bring an action saying, well, actually, you you can't serve. But I'm not as well versed in election law, so I'm not sure exactly what the precise details of that ought to be. One thing that I like about 
using the 1870 Act as, at least in broad brushstrokes, a model is it appropriately links the Trumpist effort to overturn the 2020 election results to the Klan and the, the lost cause resistance. This would be a fourth Ku Klux Klan Act that would draw the historical parallel. And I think that's a historical parallel that, for expressive reasons, um, we ought to draw. I very much agree uh, with Gerard that we want to resolve the question of whether Trump can be potentially president again uh, in January 2025 uh, before he takes the oath of office. And uh, the first Ku Klux Klan Act wouldn't really work against a president because upon becoming president, uh, which is when the first Ku Klux Klan Act could potentially apply, the president would have control over the Justice Department, uh, which would be the bringer of the enforcement action. The first Ku Klux Klan Act also wasn't exclusive. Um, it did not, on its own terms, preclude a secretary of state from saying, I'm not going to put you on the ballot, or an individual from bringing a quo warranto action in court. I think we do, regardless of your views on the merits here, I think we do want to think about a streamlined mechanism for figuring out who can be on the ballot in 2024, given that I expect we'll have at least Cruz and Hawley running. I don't know if Trump is going to run again. And we'll have secretaries of state in some jurisdictions saying, I'm not going to put them on the ballot. And we probably don't want fact-intensive litigation in 16 district courts around the country. We probably want some sort of streamlined process with direct appeal. And, and, and so what, what would that process look like for, for today? Do you have any proposals on that? I think if it's the president, we might want any, uh, or a presidential candidate, we might say that any challenge to a presidential candidate under Section 3 needs to go to the District of the District of Columbia, where it will be heard by a three-judge panel with direct appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, that's a model that we use in the voting rights context um, that seems like uh, it could potentially cross-apply here. There's a question for Congress as to whether the Justice Department should have the exclusive authority to bring an action challenging a presidential candidate. I think we have some reason to believe that uh, the framers of the 14th Amendment did not want the president to have exclusive control over its application. They didn't apply the pardon power to the 14th Amendment, uh, to Section 3, and I think pointedly so. So we might want a world in which you know, any secretary of state who uh, tries to disqualify someone or a rival candidate who tries to disqualify someone on Section 3 grounds, if it's a presidential candidate that goes to DDC. I agree with Dan entirely that the three Dutch district court is an important part of what should be done because it just avoids the problem of a single district judge who might might or might not be accused of bias being the, the sole person to decide this in the first instance. So that I think is a vital aspect of this. And then, you know, whether you want to have appeal directly from that to the Supreme Court or go through the DC circuit, for example, that's, I have, don't have a strong an opinion about that, but uh, the three Dutch district court, I think is essential. And presumably also Congress could, as part of this, let's say fourth Ku Klux Klan Act, define the terms in section three, right? So they could define insurrection and rebellion and either the courts could take that sort of seriously as a matter of deference, or even under, let's say section five, of the 14th Amendment, the courts could say, okay, Congress has in fact defined what rebellion and insurrection is within some textual constitutional parameters. Though knowing Congress, they probably, I suspect, just kick that can down to the to the courts if they ever did in fact get their act together and pass a fourth uh, Ku Klux Klan Act. I agree. We'll get into city of Bernie versus Flores problems uh, if Congress tries to define insurrection or rebellion more broadly than the court thinks the framers envisioned it. So in City of Bernie versus Flores, the Supreme Court strikes down uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which was passed pursuant to Congress's 14th Amendment enforcement power, where Congress defined religious freedom more broadly than the court defined religious freedom under the First and 14th Amendments. So we'll, we'll have the exact same issue come up if Congress adopts a very expansive definition of insurrection or rebellion. I, you know, I, I agree with that, but could, could there be more leeway for Congress in this case, simply because there isn't well-developed case law <laughs> that exists around what insurrection and rebellion means? I mean, City of Bernie, right, was Congress right after a Supreme Court decision interpreting the 14th Amendment saying, nope, we disagree. So I, I get as a, as a legal matter, I think I, I agree with you in terms of it presenting kind of a similar conceptual issue. But um, I wonder if as a practical matter, the courts might actually not even mind if Congress took the lead on defining these 
quite ambiguous terms. Well, I think that especially because of the circumstances of this attack on the Capitol, there is more reason to think there would be deference given, right? So whether you think City of Bernie would apply to Section 3 or not, that is to say, the attack was grave. So the room for a congruent proportionate response is, it seems to me, broader than it would be just for other circumstances. So I'm not sure it's so much the lack of case law. It's more about the nature of what happened and the fact that Congress was a direct witness to the attack, right? This is not something where you can say, oh, they they don't really know what's going on or they're legislating about things far away. It happened right in front of them. And if there's any case for deference, you would think that would be it. I can imagine an argument in the exact opposite direction that Congress as the victim of this crime lacks an impartiality that it might have in other contexts. And here, uh, the political fallout is so clear and so clearly uh, to the advantage of one party over the other, um, or at least one political faction over the other. I should also emphasize that if Congress, I like the idea of Congress uh, giving some teeth to the words insurrection or rebellion, despite the fact that I'm noting potential legal road bumps. They should also give some teeth to the word engage, because one could be reasonably confident that the January 6th attack on the Capitol was an insurrection and still have questions about whether Trump or Cruz or Hawley engaged in it. If in fact there was an insurrection or or rebellion uh, against the Capitol, what 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 is the work that engage here is is doing that might distinguish culpability among the various involved actors? So we have the the West Virginia delegate who was actually part of the mob inside the Capitol who subsequently resigned. But if he ran again, then we probably ought to have a Section Three case with respect to him. Then there's the question of well, is incitement of insurrection the same thing as engaging in insurrection? There was a law in 1862 that made it a crime to incite or engage in insurrection, which might be read to suggest that uh, the 1860s Congress viewed incitement and engaging in as as separate things. Trump certainly behaved irresponsibly toward the insurrection. I think he even incited it. But if we look at the instances from the late 1860s uh, where Congress excluded members who, by their words, had participated in the Confederacy. They had said things that were far more noxious than what Trump said. They had said, you know, we should hang Abraham Lincoln or any Union soldier from Kentucky ought to be shot. Uh, Whereas Trump said that the rally would be wild and that his supporters should fight. But he didn't use language as clearly violent as some of the late 1860s potential members of Congress who were excluded. And then with Cruz and Hawley, you know, they, they have culpability for the events of January 6th, but they didn't engage, in, they didn't use language uh, of the sort that Trump used uh, right before the January 6th rally. I think there's no accusation that they played the sort of role that Andy Biggs, Mo Brooks, and Paul Gosar allegedly played, where they were in, allegedly in contact with the organizers of the rally beforehand. And then we get to the 126 members of Congress uh, who filed a totally frivolous amicus brief in the Texas litigation. Well, filing a frivolous amicus brief, describing that as engaging in insurrection or rebellion, even if it was a predicate to the events of January 6th, that uh, is putting a lot of weight on the word engage. I would add that we have a lot more to learn about the events of that day which may color some of these conclusions. But in particular, as applied to the president, there's the question of what did he do or not do once the mob had entered the Capitol? Because there's there's one thing to look at his words and say, did he incite them to do what they did? But another would be, okay, once they did what they did, did he sort of turn a blind eye and hope that it was going to work out? Or did he actually take some steps to try to stop it because there is no sort of action requirement, it seems to me, to say that you've engaged in insurrection. When you have control over the levers of law enforcement and you do nothing, one might argue that that, that is kind of, uh, well, sort of tacit uh, approval of the insurrection in a way that could constitute engagement. Now, I realize, again, that's a contestable proposition, but that's something that wouldn't apply really to the members of Congress who did not 
have any control over the National Guard or you know other authorities that could go in and stop the mob sooner. Yeah, I, I agree that the case against Trump gets better after 2 p.m. on January 6th, both because of his inaction, he didn't stop this, and he did take affirmative actions after the the mob had had breached the Capitol. So the mob is trying to stop certification. Uh, he's trying to bring this effort to a successful conclusion. He's calling, he thinks Tommy Tuberville, turns out that he was actually calling Mike Lee, lobbying him to vote. Well, now that sounds a lot like the Confederate foreign minister uh, or Confederate secretary of uh, state, who's uh, not actually uh, holding the arms, but is engaged in diplomacy in order for the rebels to achieve their ends. And while there was a mob in the Capitol shouting, hang Mike Pence, and Mike Pence was in hiding, Trump tweets out, that Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what was right. Uh, that gets a lot closer to the sorts of expressions uh, at the beginning of the Civil War that get Kentucky congressmen later excluded under Section 3. Before we close out, let me, let's turn for a moment to what we might call the kind of prudential considerations around using something like Section 3. Um, and let me ask you both this question and in the following context. So if the campaign to use Section 3 continues and it gathers steam, I suspect that many Republicans, and, and perhaps just to be fair, many, even some outside the Republican Party who are quite critical of, of the president, that they will argue that Section 3 is undemocratic right? because it takes control away from the voters as to who they think should be eligible for office. right? And that if, in fact, whether it's Donald Trump or or Gosar or Hawley or Cruz or the House Republicans, if, if what they did really was truly unacceptable, then the voters will, will punish them. And so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts from, from either of you on whether you think there's anything to that argument, right? either as a matter of, of law and some kind of deeper principle of democracy, or as a matter of the health of American democratic institutions, right? Just to say that even if um, Section 3 could legally apply to this conduct if it was done correctly and there was a statute, a judicial process, and kind of all of those legal issues, um, whether or not this is the right way of dealing with the activity that, that occurred on, on January 6th. Well, if I might begin, I, I think there are a couple of considerations. The first is that the use of Section 3 against the president does not necessarily lead to the outcome you suggest, because it might simply deter him from wanting to run again, because he'd have to go through this court challenge. He might have to testify under oath about things that he did or didn't do on that day. And so in the end, it, it's not going to actually bar him. There's not going to be a, a decision barring him. It's simply going to be that it's going to be a cloud hanging over any future candidacy, and he'll simply decide for that reason and maybe others not to run. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is, I think having this all done through courts is a much preferable alternative to having this done either through an impeachment or some sort of congressional expulsion or exclusion debate, which is much more political and really not suited to careful sorting of facts. And if you go through a judicial process with full legal representation and due process and whatnot, and the result is that someone is deemed ineligible, I think that's much more satisfactory in terms of the considerations of it being anti-democratic than would be the case if, for example, the Senate convicts Trump and bars him from office, or Congress expels somebody, and then if they're reelected, what are they going to do? Expel them again? It leads you down, I think, a worse path uh, so this is a better alternative, in my view, to the others, though it, it's not without its problems. I think on the most basic level, a democratic polity can, through democratic processes, impose qualifications for office without that itself being anti-democratic. Uh, maybe if you're straight up majoritarian, um, then you would have a problem with that. But you would also have a problem with uh, the restriction on the president to being 35 years or older, or the restriction on the president to being born in the United States uh, or of, of U.S. citizen parentage. Second, I think that with appropriate procedural safeguards and with insurrection or rebellion and engage construed sufficiently narrowly, the application of Section 3 can be in service of lower case D democratic ideals. 
Um, I think it's a bad thing for a democracy when there are members of Congress who, when they think they're going to lose a vote, try to orchestrate a mob to pressure their colleagues to switch sides. And I think it's good for there to be consequences to anti-democratic behavior by the people's elected representatives uh, and other public officials. Third, I think there is a risk of abuse, and it's not just a theoretical risk. We saw an abuse of 14th Amendment Section 3 in 1919 when Congress excluded uh, Victor Berger, who was a socialist from uh, Wisconsin, from sitting in the House on the grounds that his anti-war socialism, which was much more anodyne than anything Trump has said, was a uh, violative of Section 3. So we, we've seen the devil before. And I think that is a reason why in uh, both thinking about the procedural safeguards and in interpreting insurrection or rebellion, we should do so carefully and narrowly. So I think that's a good place to, to end this conversation. Dan, Gerard, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and for uh, speaking with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. If you've liked what you've heard, please take a moment to rate the podcast or let someone know so they can enjoy it as well. This podcast is produced by Jen Patya Howell. Zachary Frank of Goat Rodeo is our audio engineer. And Sophia Yan performed our music. As always, thanks for listening.